In this episode, we'll be talking about is service design an actual design practice? We'll be talking about how do we design services for real people rather than customer journey maps and personas. And we'll talk about how do we push back against the fetization of tools and methods by embracing deep learning. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hello, everyone. My name is Laura Benning. This is the Service Design Show. And live from New York. Hi, I'm Mark, and welcome to our new episode of the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you do more work that makes you proud by designing and delivering services that are good for people and business. My guest in this episode is a true service design evangelist. She's an author, she's a service design researcher and an educator at the Parsons School of Design in New York City. Her name is Lara Pennen. The main theme of this episode will be how do we design for real people, real solutions that make their lives better. Lara has a really interesting perspective on this, which she shares with us today. If this is your first time here on this channel, I'd love to have you to subscribe as we keep bringing new videos that help to level up your service design skills at least once a week. And don't forget to click that bell icon so you'll be notified when new videos are out. And if you also like podcasts, now you can listen to the Service Design Show on Spotify and you can find the link to, to that down below in the show notes. So that's all for the introduction. And now let's quickly jump into the interview with Lara. Welcome to the show, Lara. Thank you, Mark. It's nice to be here. Nice to have someone like you on the show. Really cool. I think we have a lot to talk about. Uh, so let's not waste any more time. But uh, first of all, for the people who don't know who you are, uh, could you give like a really short introduction and also tell us a little bit about the book that just came out? Sure. Uh, my name is Laura Penning. I'm an associate professor of transdisciplinary design. I'm director of a graduate program and I'm an MFA program also called transdisciplinary design. We use service design in many ways in our program. I'm a researcher, I'm a scholar, I'm a practitioner also. I am a co-founder of a, a research and design lab called DESIS Lab at Parsons. And DESIS stands for Design and Social Innovation for Sustainability. Um, what else? Uh, uh, I just wrote a book about yeah, service book, design. Book. Mm -hmm. Tell us about so it. So it's a textbook. Here it is. It's a Designing textbook. Designing the Invisible. That's right. An Introduction to Service Design. Um, the idea of this book was to provide a resource for learners. So for folks who are going through school, either undergraduate or graduate master level or beyond, or if you're just coming from another discipline or you know background and you want to study, study uh, service design, this is a tool. Uh, the book is really a tool for you and it has uh, cover, tries to cover the basics as well as practice mm. and has some templates and exercises. Lara, I know I didn't ask you this one, uh, putting you on the spot, but uh, how about we give away a signed copy of your book to one of the people watching or listening to the show if they leave a comment? Is that possible? We can do that, yes. Oh, definitely. wow. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So uh, <laughs> the way this works, just leave a comment within the next uh, uh, week after the episode, and then mm. I'll let Lara know who won, and you'll get a signed copy. Yes, Oh, you can. awesome. Okay. <laughs> um, Lara, the, the question that I also ask to everyone on the, coming on as a guest on the show is, do you remember the first time you got in touch with service design? Where did you learn about the field? Right. So I first learned about service design when I was doing my PhD in Milan, Italy, and I joined a group of uh, researchers uh, uh, doing work and pretty much defining service design at that point or helping to define service design at that point. Um, there were a number of colleagues. Um, it was very tentative. Uh, I think my first uh, connection with service design was through the concept of product service system 
which basically try to uh, uh, servitize products and uh, create a new way for us to, uh, you know, get get stuff done without having to buy more stuff. So it was essentially <laughs> a, a strategy towards sustainability, environmental sustainability, trying to reduce um, uh, material impact of, mm. of stuff. Mm. So instead of buying the washing machine, can you pay per use and share with other people in your beauty? Mm. You know, that was a classic case study of the laundromat, for example. So that's how I got to know it. Service for me was, uh, and, you know, one entry point strategy towards sustainability, towards sustainable futures. No, services are much more sustainable than products. We don't talk about that, but that's a really interesting uh, concept. What yes. was this? When, how, how far do we go back in time? Yeah, so this goes back in early 2000s. I, my PhD uh, was from 2000, 2003 and 2006. I remain in part of that group of researchers for longer. And in a way, DESIS Network still connects me with, with my colleagues from Milan and those who also passed through, but others who haven't passed through them, but we all somehow connected through that network of, of people. Hmm. So it's been, it's been quite a while. It's been a good 15 years. I've been here at Parsons in the new school. This is my 11th year. Um, so it's been a, it's been a while and in a way I, I decided to write the book because there were no books and, uh, I would compile texts from papers, academic papers. I would also go into websites from live work engine and then download every method and everything they had available case studies from their projects and use those to teach. And so this book came out of, of that process of compiling pedagogical materials out of what was out there, both from theories and, you know, more academic uh, work, but also from the practice and practitioners. So that was that was my my you needed the book for yourself. <laughs> very yeah, much yeah. so. Very yeah. much so. Mm. Yes. Cool. Um, yeah. I'll link to make sure to link to the book also in the show notes. So if people want to know more about that, just uh, check the link down cool. below. Lara, um, I'm ready to dive into the topics that you've shared with me. I'm ready for mm -hmm. some interview jazz. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Drum roll, please. Before, because there we go. This topic is called, the first topic is called service design as design. Hmm. Do you have a question starter? We do. How much design is there in service design? I would okay. say a lot. What would you say? <laughs> I'm trying to say a lot too. So that's the case I'm trying to make. It's one of the cases that I'm trying to make in the, in, in my book uh, and with my students too. I'm, and with my, you know, the people I work with, my project partners to try to make a case for service design as a original, integrative, but also legitimate design practice in its own right. And it's, it's very ambitious because it's transdisciplinary, you know, um, uh, it's, it's not a, your usual kind of design and it does combine design thinking and design making. So I think that is the space I'm like, I like to explore. Uh, yeah, can I interrupt you for a second? Because you yes, said yes. like, uh, it's not like traditional design and what is traditional design for you? Well, this year marks 100 years of the Bauhaus, mm. and uh, the Bauhaus was all about the built environment and how designers and artists would, uh, and architects would help define the way people live. And the built environment and communication was part of that as well, uh, pretty much as being the manifestations, tangible manifestations of visions of the different preferred futures. So. I am from Brazil originally, so a city, a whole city, the, 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 the country capital was built out of the idea of a designer and ur an urbanist, of course, reflecting the political identities of the time and cultural identities. But it was essentially a design, a design act that materialized a whole city. So if you use that as an example, you can bring this towards the space of services that surround it and find our lives. So we have to have visions. And that's why I think service design is design because the primary role of design, in my view, is to create and envision 
new preferred futures. That's the, you know, that's what design has been trying to do in different ways and has been doing. Um, only we don't have a one particular medium to do so. It exactly. can be done yeah. through different ways. But there's also something interesting, and we can touch upon that later if you like, but the issue of the design thinking and the design making and the tension I think there is in service design and perhaps the reason why many people think it's not early design. Hmm. We'll get to that, I think, in the in the final topic. Um, yeah. So how how are you? Uh, how do we get there? How do we get uh, service design to be seen and valued as a legitimate design discipline? What do we need hmm. to do? I think we need to recognize that service design. Uh, it's not only about uh, improving management but it's about changing culture and mindsets. And, and this is essentially a design thing to do, to change culture. Uh, so my students, when they graduate, they go on to work in very high stakes positions sometimes within hospitals, within corporations, within international development agencies, within public agencies. And they will, through their work, change and affect the life of millions of people. Um, so I think it's important that we recognize that it is about creating, you know, the experiences through which these people will go about experiencing their services. But it's also about changing the general perceptions and general culture uh, for that people, but also within the organizations that are those providing the services. And that's why I think we are we need to embrace the idea of, of service designers design and service designers are as those who are able to provide vision and the roadmap towards those visions. So um, what do you think we're missing at this moment to, what, I, mm -hmm. what are we missing? Why, why aren't we there yet? Yeah, I think I think in, the reason we, why we aren't there yet is in a way the result of our own success hmm. because service design has been um, successfully adopted and what you know widespread now within many kinds of industries and sectors which is a great thing however there is the risk of commoditization of the methods and tools of service design because they're so nice and you know for those who don't work coming from a creative background it, it's very it's fascinating and it's enticing and it's engaging it's a lot however, of fun <laughs> it's a lot of fun. You get to play with dolls and Lego and, you know, and enact things. So it's fun and engaging, but it's not, it's not all there is. It needs, there needs to be the recognition that you can't simply pack and reproduce a number of tools and methods and ta-da, and then you get to, 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 to the result you want. Uh, design, as many people who are coming from architecture or product design, you would know that it requires a constant engagement and refinement. And sometimes you get to a point you have to start from scratch all yeah, over again. Yeah. So it's it's more about sustaining a certain process and uh, and feeding this process uh, uh, towards, towards a certain goal. But it will require long and deep engagements with, within organizations that sometimes it's hard to sustain for all kinds of reasons. Um, and it, it's, you know, it's nobody's fault. I don't, I don't want to point fingers. I think it's part of a natural pains of, of, of growing, I suppose. But I think it's what my big point here is that we are maturing as a field and we need to have a more, we need to be more critical about the work that we do, that it's not just reproducing methods. We need to be less naive about the politics of what we do when we engage in the different organizations. And, what do you mean uh, with that? Well, in, the, in which way? Politics? Well, I, I think what I mean by the politics I, of, of services, I mean things related to the internal politics of organizations for sure, but also uh, the politics of the service in, in, in uh, um, being designed or redesigned or studied. Um, and what are the different social, political, environmental implications of that? Uh, I think a big topic for me right now of interest is related to labor and work. When we design services, we're designing work and how mm -hmm. people work. Um, and, uh, you know, in an era where platform, uh, digital platforms are really taking 
over different sectors of our economy, we are always, uh, you know, risking uh, forgetting about things that happened before. The case in point, we could use Uber, for example, to talk about how, sure, there was a industry in place that perhaps wasn't the best, but all of a sudden it was taken over by another one and whose model simply ignores uh, labor rights that were acquired uh, with a lot of pain <laughs> through a long process before that. So how much do we want that for society? And now with artificial intelligence really coming you know, fast towards us, I think service designers will have a big role to play in designing uh, work and designing people sometimes out of work. You know, if you talk about some more radical experiments that people are considering, such as uh, universal income. Mm. Um, mm. But, you know, I think, I, th I think service designers are very good to, uh, they should be very good at touching upon these very critical issues that we have that are not resolved in a way that we're not just, just oiling the machine, but we're really being visionaries about the future we want. So I think it's a time for us as uh, to become critical practitioners and not just reproducing things because we, we have a, a lots of clients that are asking that from us. But I think we need to be selective and it's our role also to educate our partners, our clients in this process. That's a really, really important call to action already in this episode. Um, I, you already hinted upon upon this, so let's just move in into the second topic. Uh, and you said something about designing people out of work. I think we'll touch upon that in uh, in this one. Yeah. Um, da -da 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 -da. And it's actually called here on my paper, designing people. But I'm sure you'll be able to create an interesting, formulate an interesting question out of this. That starts with. Okay, who are people behind the services we use? Um, so for me, designing services is designing people in great part. And consequently, is designing for labor, designing for care, designing social justice. Uh, I've been very much interested in frontline staff, uh, especially those at, uh, at the forefront of social services, in critical uh, you know, services. Uh, I've been learning a lot recently in the, some projects I've been engaged with. And um, I have engaged recently with uh, public libraries in Brooklyn. Um, it's an ongoing project we have in my research lab. And one thing that I've been learning is how much emotional labor um, and how much of one person's own lived experience goes into us providing a services and engaging with a, uh, a person uh, that in many cases go above and beyond their job descriptions. And uh, this is something we have observed firsthand. We're, uh, the, the project I've been working on relates to uh, services related to uh, post-incarceration. So how, the, how libraries, one of the service areas that they are um, starting to offer is related to connect people uh, that are coming out of prisons to the service they need. This is a huge issue here in the United States and Brooklyn in some neighborhoods that you find that uh, as being a very important component of social life. So we have observed in some particular branches how uh, you know people are compassionate, people are helpful, people will help uh, patrons of the library even outside the physical space of the library, they go out and reach out and help people, help people getting help. Um, and then the question becomes, which is wonderful to see to begin with, right? But it, it's the question then for service designers is, is, how do you scale that? How do you train people? How do you sustain that kind of a very personal relationships that are part of the service engagements and their service connections. Um, and in, in, I'm giving this one example, but I think this is present in every kind of care related uh, uh, world. This is for sure the case of nurses in hospitals and doctors and, you know, and in general related to uh, people in some kind of need uh, or immigration services, right? So I think that that's where my heart is. This is where I think there is uh, 
yeah, human interest that I think it's important, but I think it's interesting for our field to understand, you know, you can design the conditions, but you can most of all provide ways to sustain things already happening. Mm -hmm. And instead of, you know, managers deciding, oh, I think people should do that. What if we learn from the things that already work and try to amplify those? So I think that is a philosophy that I'm, that I'm learning. And I think it is about designing people. It's designing their future, what they do. Can we sustain them and help them uh, be the best they can be in those positions and also give them agency to be who they are in the situations rather than just reciting out from a playbook, uh, which is what happens in a, a lot of times. No criticism, but you know you can compare the two. And I think there's a lot that can be learned from that. So I'm trying to figure out what does this mean for me as a service designer? How does this actually influence my design process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it has to do with deep learning. It has to do with uh, it's not just that, that that's the reason I was criticizing the idea of just packing up, uh, you know, tools and methods and then try to quickly go about them. I think you need to spend time with your project clients and partners and really immerse yourself there and be able to carry out, uh, you know, some kind of active listening rather than just um, interviewing people to quickly try to, you know, come up with a solution i would even argue so i think deep 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 learning deep listening actively listening and being hum humble about you're there to learn and really defer any kind of judgment and try to understand things from people's point of view and i and i mean both the user and the, and the staff uh, uh member um and also you know and that is time so you need to budget time you need to in the end we have to write contracts right yeah, we need yeah, to yeah, do yeah, people yeah, and yeah. all that so it needs to be translated in that kind of language so i think it's budgeting time and allowing for that kind of longer in engagement because there is no bullet uh silver bullet that will that will you know get to a final conclusion i personally don't like personas i think some methods have reached the limits of what they can offer I think they can be helpful, but I'm interested in the people. So I think I'm recently I'm more interested in collecting stories rather than building personas, mm, real mm. stories from real people rather than trying to put people in categories. I think that is an easy mistake. And it's easy for you to, to use your own personal bias, whether you are the privileged person in the room or not. But for sure, in most cases, designers, when you go to certain situations, you are the privileged person. So you have more power and agency over your life in some cases. And you need to be able to understand and listen and learn from the others. So mm -hmm. budgeting time, calculating, and, and you know, being able to tell that to your clients, I exactly. think it's important. Exactly. You're finding ways yeah. on how to explain the value of, of that, right? Yeah, it's true. It's not easy, but hey, you know, we've came a long way already. So I think, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's our job. Hmm. Um, I, I want to use the rest of our time that we have to, to touch mm -hmm. upon the third topic, because I think it's sort of the central theme uh, already in, mm. in this episode. So uh, let's just move into that. Is that okay? Sure, absolutely. I've narrowed it down to these two mm. words, more mindset. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Okay. How can we uh, define um, advanced mindsets for service designers that allow them to uh, go deep into the realities they're designing for? and the people in the lives of people they're designing with and for. So I will uh, go and try to define uh, a number of mindsets that I think are important. I, I write about them in the book because my last chapter. Um, and one is precisely the one I was uh, telling you just now. So learn how to be an active uh, listener and mm -hmm. learner. Mm -hmm. So it's a learner mindset and being there and listening uh, I have observed um, some case studies of colleagues who are really good at that. Uh, I work with some colleagues in my lab. We also try to use this idea of being present and you budget time and you know you're going to be several days there 
with a camera and you have to have you know the whole ethical aspect of doing research in that way uh and also you know being I, people use the word empathy a lot i think there's a lot of interest in that and knowing how to refrain from your own judgment and put yourself in the shoes of the person if uh, you know how far can you go with that and not assuming anything right um and then i think another one so that's number one number two is uh, learn how to lead and management and manage processes and conversations with with people, right? How can we stage uh, not only workshops, sometimes it's meetings, productive meetings, working sessions where people come together and, you know, and be the steward of, of those processes that can take time and will probably be revisited over and over. So, it's a more of a soft skill in the, in the end, not so much designerly, if you ask me, but it can be designerly. Sometimes we have to design the tools for that. Designers are very good at designing games, cards, and whatever are the artifacts that can su sustain those things. But it's really keeping things in, in time and revisiting. And some conversations can be really hard and painful. So um, how can we do that in, a, in, a, in, in the right way? Um, I think the other point, the third point, the third mindset is goes back to service design as design. Uh, that of our, our job is, uh, you know, learning about things, but also spotting opportunities for change for the better, right? That's what designers have been doing all, all along. Uh, we can make things better. That's mm -hmm. what it is. So we have to be able to have those visions, to be imaginative and create situations that were they aren't here yet. They are somehow it's creating the future all the time and capturing those ideas and visualizing them. That's another making it tangible, I think. making the future making, tangible. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So if you're if you're if you're a service designer who don't come from a visual design background, you should partner with one because that's part of our job too to create visuals and, and to put this in front of people. Some people prefer writing fine. Some people do videos, whatever you do, I'm here in a design school, so that's part of my day-to-day -day life, but I realize in some, in some uh, other situations, it, it isn't the case. But you should hire someone, you should be working with people who can actually do that and have that skill. Um, and then, and related to that is um, materializing, materializing, but also testing and simulating. You have, it's the famous prototype. You have to enact, right? You have to really enter the performance Perform performatic aspects of services. Services they unfold. They don't just you just don't put it there. And there's nothing like you know enacting something to feel how you just know and you you just know it's wrong or it's right and you can take leads from that. I've been reading a lot of uh, drama literature mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. for actors lately, and you know and we perform every day. We, we're performing now. We're performing all the time. Everything is a performance, but I think that uh, I, I like to use the idea of services as a performance when I'm when I'm designing uh, uh, service prototypes because service prototype is not just an object. You have to put something out there, and people need to do something with that. So I think the idea of a performative kind of approach to prototypes um, uh, things become true right when you enact them when you perform them. And I think, uh, lastly, uh, my first fifth point is related to um, uh, knowing that our work uh, is going to be other process uh, also, and ultimately you're working towards uh, first learning how organizations work, but you know, defining your work in relation to that. So your job is about changing them and changing an organization, and that's hard to do. And you have to be humble. You cannot come from you know parachuting uh, and not knowing how that is going to be like. I know that. I work in a very complex organization where universities tend to be that. But uh, I guess that's the case elsewhere as well. And um, you have to build your way towards. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot, you know, that goes into beauty relationships with people inside organizations and clients, not only the the top level management, but you have to develop relationships with everybody in different areas and understand where people are coming from. I'm saying this because I, 
most of my work is public interest design. So whether it's not for profits and government and some of these organizations for their, their very nature, they tend to be very, ugh, you know, not sometimes not interested in changing things because they're always either in a shoestring or they are, you know, subjected to all kinds of scrutiny from the public, rightly so, you, if you're a public uh, institution. And so they're a bit risk averse in terms of, you know, trying new things or we do things in this way, you know, this is bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is out there because you need them. You need to, things to be controlled mm -hmm. so that corruption mm -hmm. doesn't happen, right? So there's a reason behind that. But on the other hand, it creates a really, you know, you know, tightened uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 organizations and flows that are not necess necessarily the best, um, uh, the best, the most open kind of organization for change. And mm. people need to want them. So it is a process that you need to steward rather than impose. <clears throat> That's that's a lot to process, uh, and and I uh, I can definitely recommend people getting the book. But just one question related to this uh, is, you know, mm -hmm. you work with students every day, and you um, mm -hmm. probably explain these four mindsets, um, and they they sort of feel that this shouldn't be service design, shouldn't be productized and oversimplified into uh, tools and methods. How do you get them to actually? do this so how do you challenge them to adopt these mindsets well uh with with our students we do that by uh proposing nice projects hands-on and related to you know somehow part of the real world so we work with partner organizations who have us uh coming over and you know giving us access to people and to to them um and these are studios that we design, you know, and, and sort of curate for students. Um, but they also do theses on their own, so they have to do them by themselves, this kind of thing. And you know that part of their time in doing something like that is to just build relationships. So that is a long year long, more than a year long process, actually. So that's how, how we do in this education environment. Uh, in an education environment is different from, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, real this is real life, by the way, too. People say, oh, it's not real life. It is real life. So I'm just saying that to you dissipate that, that notion. But we have, the, we have the opportunity here to create a, some, some sort of a protected environment where uh, the stakes are high, but they're, not, they're different from, from when you were a designer out in the world and you have to pay yourself and pay yeah, people yeah. working for you. Yeah, there are other constraints. For you. Yeah. yeah, there are other constraints. So it is a sort of protected environment. So we simulate, we do it, we curate, and we do that in a way that makes sense for a partner organization who have access to a lot of intelligent people doing interesting work and questioning things and coming up with interesting ideas. Uh, but it is different from, you know, hiring a, a you know, a, a professional designer. That will happen later when they graduate, <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully. I, I'm, I'm sure of it. Um, Lara, you've given us so much uh, uh, food for thought that's the right <laughs> expression but i'm sure there's also something on your mind that you would like to share with us a question that you would like to ask us the service design show community is there anything on your mind <laughs> yeah i think things i wanted to bring to our community is related to things that i've touched upon uh, is this design uh are we what is your what is your politics as a, as a service design? Can you talk about it? Can you think about it for yourself? Um, what, it, what, are, what is the role of aesthetics in your, in your, in your work? Uh, you know, aesthetics is not, it's not just the, the color of something. It's much more than that. That would determine how you would, you know, behave in a certain space. And I think this, the, the aesthetic question we haven't, this, we haven't had that conversation enough, or if at all, in our community. And somehow I see the aesthetics question, the political question, as being related. Interesting. Um, I think there. I think that is uh, that is the new book I want to write, <laughs> and uh, these are these are uh, elements that I I want to uh, I want to uncover 
I think sometimes the touch points, you know, it's just one entry door towards a much bigger discussion. Working in public interest design, somehow you have to confront yourself with that and the cultural implications of things. So these are these are aspects of uh, services that I don't think have been enough discussed. Mm. So I think it's something our community need to uh, do more about. And uh, I think it's our job in academia also to be pushing for the discussions that people working with clients, they don't have the opportunity to do that. It's Well, this is the opportunity for the community to contribute to your new book by leaving, <laughs> yes, <I laughs> by leaving so. comments on, uh, on the podcast or the video. Um, and let's not forget, uh, we'll be giving away a signed copy of your book. So uh, make, make yes. sure to leave a comment in general. Lara, it was really a pleasure to listen to you. Uh, so much inspiration. Um, thanks so much for making time in this busy period of the year. Um, <laughs> again, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Mark. So what is your take on service design and aesthetics and service design and politics? Leave a comment down below and just of all, leave a comment because then you'll make a chance for, uh, to get that signed copy of Lara's latest book. If you enjoyed this episode and know somebody who might be interested in what we've just discussed, don't forget to share this episode with, uh, with them. You'll help to grow the service design show community and you'll probably put a smile on somebody's face. If this is your first time here, I'd love to have you to subscribe to the channel uh, so that we can keep bringing you more videos like this. Thanks so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.